for me tonight. Okay, welcome everybody to this uh, special webinar. We have a kind of a special format today. Um, so we have four speakers, as you probably know. There's um, Giovanni Briganti, there's Dennis Grun, and Sergei Morozov. But I will kick off the meeting with uh, an introduction. Uh, it will take about 10 minutes, and um, I will give a few, I will tell you a few words about um, AI in the radiology workflow um, uh, to explain you where we stand. So this is the title of my presentation, Where Do We Stand? So first of all, I have to show you some disclosures. Now, um, as you probably, as most of you probably know, the number of AI vendors and commercially available products is quite large already. Um, currently, we have more than 200 CE mark products in the European market. The number of products is still increasing, as you can see on this uh, graphic. In 2021, two thirds uh, of the listed products were aimed at radiology, but the proportion this year has grown to 75%. So most of these applications are quite narrow, um, have a narrow scope and a task, which creates the risk of stacking, having to stack applications with maybe unclear added value throughout the workflow and the care process. But again, as you can see in this graphic, um, we have, um, as a clear growth in the number of commercially available products and also the number of products in the development phase is certainly increasing. Um, and as I said, it's mainly radiology. So most radiology products or commercial products are related to pixel-based image analysis, uh, so-called image processing. And on top of this, um, Graphic on the left side, you clearly see that radiology is in the lead and followed by uh, cardiovascular applications. So radiology is clearly keeping a large distance to any other specialty. And part of the reason of, for the concentration of applications in radiology, of course, is that there's more data for device developers to draw on from imaging and all data are standardized in DICOM format, which is quite uh, easy for them. Now, we see that most apps are pixel-based, as I said, and these are the uh, subspecialty domains in which most applications can be found. So on top is neuroradiology, and then you have also chest radiology, breast, of course, and MSK, and that the other subspecialties are smaller. Uh, we see that also most of the applications are for CT analysis, but a lot of them also for MRI and chest X or X-ray, I'm sorry, and mammography even, and a very small part for ultrasound. Now, um, what um, are currently the most uh, use cases for uh, AI? First of all, uh, I think uh, applications are mostly used in practice for emergency diagnostics, such as stroke and brain hemorrhage. We also have trauma, uh, like fracture analysis, pulmonary emboli, etc. Oncology also has, uh, is, a, is a quite large segment. Uh, we have applications for prostate cancer analysis uh, on MRI, for example, lung cancer, breast cancer. These are the domains where we use AI solutions. Then, of course, also the high volume examinations have several applications. And then I'm talking about chest X-ray, screening CT, and then screening for breast, lungs. There's also applications for time-consuming examinations, such as, such as cardiac MRI, brain MRI, lumbar spine MRI, prostate MRI, because these, this is where the AI applications can assist radiologists in re reducing reading time, for example. And then we have uh, several more use cases, um, and I'm classify them under uh, the group of sustainability, because several applications allow us to reduce the injection of and intravenous contrast or reduce the scan times with MRI. Also, uh, they enable us to re reduce the radiation with scans. And also they can help us in reducing waste and energy consumption because, because we can save uh, scan time and, um, and products, et cetera. And then of course, an old, another group is also opportunistic screening. And this is maybe more in the future. These both are actually most these two groups are, I think, more future perspective or future applications. And opportunistic screening means that um, in routine examinations, 
all kinds of measurements can be performed. For example, uh, the, the bone density measurement in, in CT scans, or quantification of coronary calcifications in routine chest CTs, or maybe entire body composition analysis. I will explain this later. Now, what are the expectations of radiologists in AI? And this is uh, information I got from one of the courses I gave. Well, um, many radiologists uh, expect AI to help them in speeding up their workflow, to facilitate the workflow, to increase efficiency, accuracy, to accelerate the answer and to correct mistakes, to increase the work speed again, to improve the report sensitivity. And this is an important reason to help out staff shortage. And uh, some radiologists also say it can reduce work workload by doing tedious tasks and help to minimize the risks. This is an interesting publication. It's very recent from uh, the Dutch uh, health authorities, and um, it made a, an analysis of different applications of AI within different domains, not only radiology. But what they say in this report is that artificial intelligence offers great opportunities for healthcare. But the biggest challenge at this moment is that AI applications are mainly deployed as supplementary care, whereas they think it would be better to, uh, let's say, integrate them in the existing care process instead of, um, so it means that um, healthcare will have to undergo a process of transformation where these applications are completely integrated. Now, what is the evolution of uh, artificial intelligence? What uh, the market I want to say, first of all, in the beginning, we had uh, mainly, um, let's see, yes. We had individual AI vendors, but now we can see that this is shifting to marketplaces. And um, what we can also see is that the individual AI vendors are rather consolidating, which means that the number is not growing anymore and they are working, they are collaborating. On the other hand, we see separate marketplaces, for example, which are launched by PAX vendors or by equipment vendors, maybe also, and that's for sure, the pharmaceutical industries uh, jumping in this market. And then of course we have vendor neutral or independent platforms. Now we know, you probably know that the market is uh, growing rather slowly. And I will give you a few reasons why I think this is the case. There's a medical reason, there's technical reasons, managerial and also financial reasons. What are the medical ones? First of all, radiologists do not have a lot of uh, knowledge and awareness about these applications. Um, they also are missing kind of scientific proof uh, of outcomes, and they also have some legal and ethical concerns regarding liability and privacy. There's technical reasons as well. Uh, radiologists want the seamless integration of AI with their existing systems, such as the PACs, and I think this is certainly uh, the right thing to do. Um, so the technical element uh, of IT infrastructure is also important. And then a lot of IT departments in hospitals are still understaffed, which is slowing down the whole process. And we also know that there's an ongoing shift from on-prem to cloud-based infrastructures, but not all hospitals are doing this already. There's concerns about data protection and uh, the hospitals want to do this uh, perfectly. And of course, we also know that this evolution is going fast. So AI departments or IT depart departments have limited experience. The, what are the managerial issues? First of all, we know that the medical community is rather conservative, so we do need some change management here. Of course, which is essential is to have local champions which are launching these initiatives. And then um, on a, we, we all know that procurement cycles are rather slow in hospitals. We also do need competent staffing for project management. And um, a lot of hospitals still have very limited evidence uh, of efficiency of AI tools. And it's quite difficult to make a business case to obtain return on investment. And then the last one, financial. Of course, we do know that we have, the hospitals have budgetary restraints. There's inflation, there's energy costs. We have the aftermath of COVID and there's no reimbursement yet for AI applications. This is a example I wanted to give you of a seamless integrated solution where measurements and detection and me measurements are made automatically, even a long red score is provided, and then even a report is being provided with a suggestion of treatment or follow-up of the lesion. So this is kind of the ideal solution that most of us are looking for. Now, is it autonomous AI? Could that be the future? There's some products already on the market, 
for example, for chest ray analysis, and nowadays what's possible, and this is this solution is certified to do that, um, it's made that uh, for the purpose of filtering out the normal chest x-rays and generating an automated report in these cases where there's no findings. And of course, it's a question, do radiologists still have to validate this or not? So there's some real legal discussion ongoing. This is uh, what I wanted to say about future developments. Of course, I think that in the future, more applications will be integrated in one single application. For example, we will have applications where routine chest TTs um, can be used to simultaneously analyze the interstitial lung disease, pulmonary nodules, coronary vessels, quantification of calcium scoring, maybe also osteoporosis, and maybe even the body composition. So I think we're going in this direction. And also radiomics will have to be mentioned here because they will allow us to measure automatically some or to quantify some data automatically. And of course, uh, radiomics will also be integrated with other data such as uh, genetic data. And then we speak about radiogenomics. This is an example of a non-gated chest CT for calcium scoring. So it's a normal CT scan as we do it with the lungs. And this is the manual annotation that is being performed in the coronary vessels. And this is the automated one, which is quite accurate. So this is already an example of what is uh, waiting for us to appear in the market. This is a first stage of uh, AI prediction of disease progression. So measurements are being made automatically, also longitudinally. So follow-up is done automatically. And this way, when we integrate this with other data, such as genomics, we will be able to predict co cognitive decline, for example, and brain atrophy in Alzheimer's diseases. Uh, or we will be able to pro uh, make prognosis in the uh, therapeutics or the efficiency of special uh, medication, for example, in multiple sclerosis. But such AI systems, they have to be integrated with the clinical workflow. And of course, they also require integration with the electronic health records. So data and system interoperability here is really essential. The market will grow, that's for sure. AI has become commonplace to solve routine everyday tasks. The workload on radiologists is steadily increasing. And we do know that there's an exponential growth in medical imaging um, and the complexity of those examinations. The gap between the number of imaging examinations and the number of radiologists available uh, to cover this increase will continue to expand. And consequently, there is a growing demand for tools that improve the efficiency and with, a, with radiologists, uh, with which radiologists can comfortably, comfortably interpret examinations. Conclusion, although AI is often seen as a sneaky entity that will soon replace radiologists, uh, this misconception, I think, is far from reality. From the standpoints of implementation and adoption, AI healthcare is still in its infancy. Imaging with AI adequately trained models will assist and not replace radiologists in their routine clinical practices, and it will help them to reduce workloads in the near future. What is essential is an AI infrastructure that efficiently interfaces with the existing operations and um, workflow. And the complete care process will have to undergo a transition to optimal integration of AI-based solutions. So I hope you're ready for AI, and I will now leave the stage for the other speakers. And I think the following speakers is Giovanni. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric, for uh, this very- I think you're brief, muted, uh, uh, Giovanni. Uh, I okay. can hear myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. it seems that you can. Um, okay, so I'm sharing my screen now and I hope you will see my slides. Generally, there are no problems with that. And okay. Uh, so, uh, wow, that is this is my first time speaking to radiologists. It's quite a, uh, an, an enthusiast of um, uh, imaging informatics. So uh, it is a, a quite an honor for me. Uh, I myself am, am not a radiologist. I am a medical doctor, but I, uh, I do psychiatry. So uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, quite a bit uh, a more, uh, say, a frivolous uh, domain of, of medicine where uh, such qualitative aspects are present. Uh, but I'm also the chair of uh, AI and digital medicine uh, at the University of Mons, which is a, a Belgian uh, university. And uh, um, I was asked to give you an overview of a more general approach to AI in a view of um, European regulations and uh, landscape. 
Um, so uh, apart from radiology, as uh, Eric uh, explained it, uh, AI goes far beyond in uh, whole domains of healthcare and uh, touches uh, basically uh, all specialties, including my own. Um, and uh, the, I often divide uh, the domains in which AI is present in um, in the new healthcare, as I like to call it, uh, are uh, several. I list here a few of them. Uh, we can monitor diseases thanks to AI. We can uh, diagnose, of course, with radiology. It is quite straightforward to see how this can be uh, brought upon. Uh, we can predict uh, future events, uh, prevent um, decades before uh, diseases present themselves, um, provide clinical intelligence for physicians and uh, other healthcare professionals, augment humans, which uh, uh, prosthetic uh, and uh, other technologies, as well as uh, reduce the administrative burden. Uh, to me, the last point is quite important. Uh, reducing administrative burden for uh, healthcare professionals, especially physicians, is the next step, the next best step to take uh, to improve the adoption of AI in clinical, uh, in clinical medicine. And this can be done with several technologies, of course. So uh, in Belgium, uh, we uh, led the very first national uh, barometer, uh, the very first national investigation on uh, clinicians' perspectives on AI. Uh, this was published last year, and uh, we are about to publish the second edition, which will include uh, general practitioners as well. And as you can see, uh, uh, clinicians' perspective on AI are quite positive. Uh, clinicians expect AI to increase readability and uh, reliability of decision making, uh, to free up time for added value tasks. Once again, we are uh, tackling uh, the more administrative part of uh, the work of a, a clinical doctor to reduce error risk and allow for personalized uh, follow up. So, as you can see, the um, uh, the, 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 what concerns physicians the most is focused on first improving uh, the quality of healthcare provided to patients, second to improve the performance and the quality of life at work for clinical uh, professionals and reduce uh, the uh, error risk, um, of course. And uh, this is why in Belgium, we, uh, after this barometer, we, uh, we, we have published a national convergence plan on artificial intelligence global, not only for healthcare. And um, the, 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 the Belgian plan is just one of many uh, strategies of artificial intelligence across Europe. Uh, France has one uh, strategy, Germany has a strategy, England has a strategy, although they have uh, left Europe. Um, uh, the, uh, the Dutch have a strategy, and uh, other countries are as well uh, tackling uh, their own strategies for artificial intelligence. This is, of course, uh, very important because uh, we do need uh, a common strategy to go forward uh, with AI, especially uh, in such a fragmented ecosystem that is Healthcare. And so, as you see, uh, there are efforts being done in establishing what physicians need when it comes to AI, uh, at least in Belgium, we do. Um, many ask me if we are not directed towards a new AI winter. Um, I respectfully disagree because we do uh, have all the elements in place to keep the revolution going, but we are directed towards a, a replication crisis in AI. So what is a replication crisis? Uh, you may have heard uh, many results in science do not replicate to other populations. And so most of the inference that we make in science often goes wrong. And uh, this is uh, about to be the same, to become the same with AI, uh, especially in uh, such advanced domain, such populated domain as radiology. So why uh, are we about to have a replication crisis? And how do we have to solve it? Uh, well, of course, as you know, and as Eric explained it, we have a, a market that is rapidly growing with many, many applications present in uh, radiology and other clinical domains. Uh, most of these apps uh, are developed uh, using unreliable design and uh, using unreliable um, uh, methods to achieve uh, what they are set to achieve. In, uh, in our countries, we see uh, often um, AI, AI software being um, advertised or being sold in hospital before having been clinically um, uh, validated through studies. Most of the uh, applications uh, that uh, are present on the market haven't yet uh, received some um, evidence uh, from clinical studies when it comes to AI. And this we need to do. We need to improve the clinical validation of core concepts and tools that come from artificial intelligence in healthcare. And this cannot be achieved 
if national authorities or national institutes are not uh, installed. As you saw on the first slide, um, I am the holder of uh, a chair on AI and digital medicine. It was the first in Belgium uh, with this scope that we need to validate core concepts uh, and tools in artificial intelligence and digital medicine if we wanted to replicate and if we wanted to integrate and change the clinical workflow. The second uh, challenge is the quality of uh, data and the models that accompany them. Uh, as uh, Eric explained in, in radiology, uh, this is a big, uh, big phenomenon. We need to have uh, larger sample sizes with larger quality of data if we want to, uh, if we want models to fit larger populations, uh, basically nationwide. And the third, let us uh, drop the study of AI versus physicians. Uh, I know I, I teach uh, to engineers and I know how they think uh, when they develop some new AI algorithm. Well, they test the new AI algorithm versus the uh, gold standard, which is the, the medical doctor itself. But of course, this does not work uh, because care will of, of always be delivered uh, by doctors in, in, in their uh, whole process. And this is why we need to stop studying AI versus physicians and stop start studying the combined forces of physicians plus AI in clinical context, hence my first point on the clinical validation. So um, I tried to sum up in one slide where I think, uh, where we are in uh, on a European framework uh, when, when it regards to AI. So uh, European strategies are taking shape, and this is my first point. Uh, I'm quite an optimist when it comes to um, AI, as I see uh, my fellow European countries uh, taking initiatives to uh, lead AI change and many countries are adopting strategies. My own country, Belgium, has uh, started to adopt um, a strategy two weeks ago with a national uh, convergence plan that has been published online. And for health, uh, of course, we also have a, a specific plan. So this is a first uh, step towards implementation. Uh, many countries uh, have their own coalition, national coalitions and ecosystems uh, concerning AI. Belgium has one, uh, France has one, Germany also has one, and uh, the Dutch also ha has one. Um, and so as we see, uh, coalitions, strategies are taking place. This impacts healthcare directly because it improves adoption of technologies, because we have trusted parties. Uh, reimbursement, as we uh, we see um, in Belgium, we do have uh, the start, the premises of a reimbursement plan for um, uh, digital health applications, which some of them include AI, but AI is not reimbursed as such, as Eric was explained uh, was explaining before. Uh, France has a national reimbursement plan for uh, digital health apps, and Germany also has uh, one one strategy. Uh, but of course, this has to move forward if we want to improve the access to digital apps. Regulation is being solved with national uh, national guidelines and national do uh, international documents on the European level. Um, but it has one flaw. I will come back to it uh, just uh, afterwards. And uh, thanks to European Health Data Space, uh, we will be able to um, have a facility in sharing uh, data, uh, qualitative data across national uh, data authorities and with third parties for innovation. So this is uh, um, how far are we in the topic of the um, AI in healthcare in Europe. What have we yet to solve? Um, okay, so we, we do have some challenges here, and um, I just list three of them. Of course, there are many more. The first is, I said it before, the clinical validation um, of a core concept tools and uh, solutions based on national and supranational levels. We do need national authorities to coordinate the validation of clinical AI and to supervise the validation of algorithms, but also we do need it um, a transnational and international for European countries so that we can make multi-centric studies uh, for the main technologies. Um, we also need to yet develop a social economy of clinical AI. As we saw in the uh, European Health Data Space uh, uh, documents, um, uh, a correct usage of uh, the data with AI models could bring uh, several billions per year in economies made by the European Union when it comes to uh, the usage uh, of AI in healthcare. We need to reinforce that by um, taking up a real social economy uh, for clinical AI because individual data has value and we can use that value to improve healthcare. And the third and last point that I have today for you is that we need to protect uh, the professionals that are uh, using AI. A random radiologist in a given hospital, if he is given an AI software to work with, 
we need to protect that radiologist because he may not know whether the software has been correctly developed, if it has been validated. We just know that it has been sold to the hospital and uh, that he has to use it somehow. It is make it um, at his disposal. And so we need to, a professional uh, a professional defense of uh, physicians that are using AI. And this is not being discussed yet in our national and international authorities. So a, a professional defense will also be necessary. And this we are yet to do. So um, I uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I will not be here for the Q&A session, but I invite you, if you want to reach out to me, add me somewhere, Twitter, LinkedIn, or uh, reach me by email, uh, I will be more than happy to uh, reach. Thank you, uh, Sergei, Eric, for the invitation. Thank you to Ozimis and uh, Yusomi, uh, and uh, such a pleasure to be with you today. Okay, thank you applause very much. Online. Applause online. Yeah, applause online. Yeah, applause online. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Uh, I was forgetting to tell you, of course, that this uh, You Show Me webinar is being sponsored by Osimis. And of course, uh, you probably also know that you do have the opportunity to send us your questions and answers. We will discuss this in the panel after the last lecture uh, is given. So we will start collecting the questions and uh, I hope we, we can also have a nice discussion afterwards. But now I first want to give the word to Sergey. Sergey, please, it's your turn. Um, yeah, we can do, yes, we can do this way. Thank you, thank you, Frederick. Just one second. I shall be sharing the screen. So do you see the presentation now? Probably you do. Yes, okay. Okay, good. thank you. Yes. Thanks, Eric. What what a night! What a night! So we are heading to RSNA, which is starts in just in few days, and uh, today we have really good array of speakers. So I'm honored to be a part of that board. So let's dive into that. And I wanted to start from making a comparison to uh, self-driving cars. Uh, Eric has been using Tesla since many years ago, and uh, he's still using Tesla. And I think this is a really nice comparison to show what are the five stages of radiology reporting automation. So what we see for the self-driving cars is the first stage is the driver only. Then we proceed to the assisted driving, partially automated, highly automated, and fully automated. What do we see? How can we make this analogy for radiology? The first stage is radiology only. So this is the human who performs pattern recognition, analysis, reporting, and final approval. The second stage is the detection of normal studies and pathology by AI for attention, focus, and, tri and triage. This is done now by multiple AIs on the market. The third stage is assisted analysis for automated detection and measurements by AI for the report pre-population by numbers and figures. The fourth stage is recognition, analysis, categorization, which is actually diagnosis, for example, by rats, or tyrants, or pirates, or lyrets, whatever, or langrets, in order to prepare the report uh, template. And the final stage, the top stage, is fully automated, which is uh, provided by several, few, by few AIs on the market at the moment, is the reporting analysis, reporting uh, recognition analysis, reporting, and final approval of the, uh, at the moment of the normal results, but more uh, is yet to come. And we shall see how the industry matures to become, to provide uh, finally approved by uh, autonomous AI reports, which are not completely autonomous because they, those reports will be taken care by the radio, by, by physicians who are, in, uh, who are in the decision making position to prescribe the treatment for, for the patient. So uh, what is available? There are multiple tools already on the market which provide beautiful images augmented by AI in order to look for pathology, to make measurements of the extremities such as glimmer, meal view, uh, image biopsy labs, to analyze emergency studies, uh, especially in the hospitals which lack radiologists every day. We have radiologists, for example, only once per week, uh, or analyze chest CT, the way contact slow or IDENTS are doing that or to analyze brain MRI so in the way icometrics or pixel doing that, and uh, even to analyze a lumbar spine, the way Columba is uh, performing that and providing the report, which attracts 
a lot of attention from referring physicians, but also for patients. So we see how AI actually increases the patient's compliance and increases patient's uh, attraction towards those physicians who use AI. So it's not a uh, substitution of uh, physicians. It, it is just the, the higher reliability of the healthcare system, which is based on AI usage. But what is the problem that we're solving with that? Uh, we perfectly well understand, uh, and this is, there was very well uh, evidence-based by the recent study from um, Stanford, uh, published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2022, that actually radiologists are very different. There's a group of radiologists who are very good, who are experts, and there's a long tail, you can see it here on the, on the picture, uh, on the graph, on the RC curve, of those who are actually underperforming because of different circumstances, because of emergency, because uh, of the uh, studies that they have to report, which are not of their subspecialty, uh, because of the because they are residents, uh, because they are still in training, because they, they don't have enough experience. So there are a lot of radiologists who actually need to be augmented. Uh, and one of the way to do that, uh, well, teaching is certainly the way to do that, but also AI can help to uh, perform better and to perform well on the level of expert. So once you want to implement AI, uh, similar to what Eric was proposing, there are several scenarios that I would like to suggest. The first one is the high volume of our emergency patients. Uh, what is the challenge there? Radiologist limited availability. The general radiologists who have to report MSK and neuro, which re require certain uh, subspecialized skills, and radiology residents who do pre-reading. These can work for multiple modalities. The solution to provide annotated images and automated reports and this really works in favor of radiologists and emergent physicians and, and pediatricians. The second scenario is high volume imaging portfolio, such as screening or oncology. And there are multiple subtle findings. There's a long turnaround time of reporting and we can augment multiple modalities in order to provide triage and automate the reports in favor of radiologists and oncology. The third scenario is the case of general hospital with budget constraint. Well, everyone actually has budget constraint. So the, there is a lack of radiology subspecial, uh, subspecialists for many hospitals and modalities which can be augmented are listed here, brain MR, prostate MR, chest CT. So AI can provide annotated images, automated reports for the use of radiologists and multiple other specialties. The fourth scenario is actually the augmentation of images for the use of surgery. So it is kind of AI which helps to do modeling, uh, image-based calculations, templating, for example, for AI, for, um, sorry, for implant selection. And th this is useful for orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, hepatobiliary, pancreatic surgeons, and invasion cardiology. And finally, there's teleradiology practice, which has high volumes of normal reports, and those can be charged in order to redistribute the workflow be between different levels of specialists with the help of AI. And certainly that makes a uh, huge, uh, huge gain, efficiency gain in order to decrease the report turnaround time and to provide more high SLAs for the referent physician. So who is in lead of that? The, the major leader for that is actually the team leader, the chief of radiology. So the one who learns and practices team management and the one who can substitute the very well-known defensive radiology with radiology team, which has proper tools and proper instruments to really augment the workflow and become the better team, to, make the, to become the more efficient team and more strong team to face any demands and requests from the referring physician. How to do that? There should be an AI task force at the hospital, which is led by chief of radiology together with chiefs or representatives of multiple other departments, which should include radiology AI project manager, IT project manager, PAX admin, DPO, and procurement manager. And usually the process starts from collection of volumes, uh, uh, from uh, preparation of checklist in order to deploy uh, AI solutions and uh, platform a gateway in order to make use of multiple solutions. There should be a test and training phase before actual go live stage and then customer success building for the several months and 
further AI evolution to make the best use of multiple AI services. But what is actually, what should be uh, provided? So what is the way, what is the methodology to do that? So first of all, we should be practical, uh, pragmatic. We should, first of all, define what is the goal of AI introduction. So how would we uh, get the value out of that? Uh, we should understand that the product is not a magic. AI is not a magic. It's software as medical device for automation of radiologist work or function. The price is based on fee for service and there is currently very strong price competition on the market. So uh, hospitals have a lead and they have reasons to argue for the price and to negotiate for the price. The place of the AI proposition is either direct or via PEX or through the platform or marketplace. The promotion is based on objective metrics. So everyone should bring the data to justify the accuracy of the AI service. But there are also subjective factors, such as the uh, type of the image, how it looks like, the colors, the, the reference, the recommendations of peers, the um, emotional factors, so they are also important. So not only objective, but also subjective factors. And there should be a passion to introduce AI to dare to go for AI augmentation of the existing workflow. The product should be perform performing very well, SLA from 20 seconds to several hours if it's uh, uh, AI, which goes for uh, difficult tasks of, uh, for example, analyzing liver MRI or cardiac MRI, so SLA might be higher. The sensitivity usually should be very high in order not to miss a pathology. Specificity could be lower, but at least 85% in order not to provide too many false positives. False negatives are usually minimized for, by fine tuning uh, a threshold uh, of the AI reaction at the deployment stage, and uh, it shouldn't be missing any uh, single case. False positives, so physicians should be aware of typical cases of false positives in order not to overly uh, on AI and in order not to receive too many questions from referring physicians. So there should be expectation building and teaching uh, before deploying AI. And PPE and NPV and also uh, net promoter score are to be collected uh, in the real world with real world usage of AI in the prospective analysis, in prospective trials, which are actually uh, in shortage now on the on the market in the in the uh, medical research. Then you want to select AI. You should be looking at multiple domains. Four major of them are medical, uh, quality assurance and regulatory, technical and business wise. So you need to understand the quality of uh, medical AI. You need to understand the legal everything legal behind that AI. You need to understand how it is integrated and how it is uh, provided as a uh, service, what is the price, how it is sold, what are the regulate, uh, what are the, uh, what is the guarantee, what are the conditions and terms for, for AI provision. Then you need to understand how to, in, uh, how to integrate AI into the existing workflow, whether you use it for dose reduction or faster scanning or work list triage or for image markers, for measurements, for classifying pathology, for reporting template. There's a lot in the existing standards of DICOM and especially IHE in order to make the best use of the information which can be directly fed into the existing workflow. I think it's the most important to seamlessly integrate AI without multiple viewers coming on top of that in order to really feed the existing workflow. Then this is the really great paper which uh, Eric was sharing recently with, uh, uh, with me. Uh, it's the best way to go is through several stages. The first phase is the project kickoff. The second stage is the limited clinical deployment of AI progressing further with successful completion of the second stage into the third stage of the full clinical deployment when AI results are available to referring physicians and also to the patient. Then it's the best, uh, the best use of that. However, what is important to understand that the first stage of AI deployment usually comes with certain challenges. So for example, this is my practical experience and uh, one of the uh, publications of Medarxi, of my team, where we have observed the initial variation, huge variation of AI uh, performance on the initial stage, but with the time, with a certain augmentation, it all becomes more stable uh, and radiologists become 
uh, happy and satisfied with the actual deployment. Uh, but the first stage is usually quite uh, unstable, quite chaotic, and that's why most of AIs come with the first month of uh, uh, free usage. Then there's a possibility to calibrate AI at the initial stage in order to, for example, maximize uh, sensitivity, not to miss any pathology. And the best way to do that is with ROC curve by uh, testing and trying with a reference data set and uh, finding the perfect uh, separation point, the point which maximizes both sensitivity and specificity, but the major focus should be uh, certainly on the, on the sensitivity. And the quality assessment of AI can be based on, on the set of criteria. So the first one is the satisfaction of end users, which is measured perfectly well by questionnaires, by uh, net promoter score. So what is the probability that you would recommend this AI to your friends and colleagues from one on the scale from one to, uh, to 10? Reading speed, time checking. This could be done with uh, business intelligence to analyze how the reporting speed uh, and the report turnaround time has changed uh, before AI and after AI integration. Diagnostic accuracy based on quantitative uh, parameters. So to compare the report of radiologist with the uh, uh, report of AI and diagnostic accuracy based on qualitative parameters to do deep dive peer review of actual content of the reports in order to understand what are the reasons of errors. Are they based on the... Uh, uh, errors of pattern recognition, or are they based on the uh, errors of classification? For example, this is deep dive. And then once you have integrated AI, the question is when a uh, return on investment comes up. Uh, immediate ROI comes with protection against missed pathology, against errors. The second level ROI comes up with increased productivity by augmenting residents and general radiologists. Third level ROI, the workload redistribution by feeding the radiologist workplace with priorities and fourth level ROI providing results directly to referring physicians, especially in cases of emergency diagnostics when the information and the analysis should be available for those who make the, uh, the decision. And there is a data behind that. Uh, there are multiple studies now and the body of data is building up to demonstrate the actual economic efficiency, which is brought by AI platform, certainly that makes more sense uh, for the management of the hospital in order to uh, look for the money uh, to, to purchase AI for the long term. And the, there's the, the body of data is becoming much, much stronger. So as key points, and uh, in order to summarize my, uh, my talk, uh, AI must be integrated in the reporting workflow directly without extra burden to radiologists. The accuracy of AI algorithms must be clearly displayed for radiologists and others making decisions on patient management. AI findings must be communicated to recent packs using existing standards. Workflow must be robust enough to ensure an analysis complete before human reporter starts image interpretation. So this is according to Royal College of Radiology recommendations. And uh, the fifth point that I'm adding uh, on my personal description is that AI platform provides Vendor's choice, ease of integration, and power of scalability. I think it's a really good way. And this is something provided now by companies on the market, including Ozimis. And there are multiple hostels which are already using platforms. For further knowledge, please consult USOMI website and the books which have been published by uh, USOMI team. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for their attention. Thank you very much, Sergey. This was an excellent overview of all possibilities of AI which are currently available and what we can do with it as radiologists. And of course, the difficulties that we can encounter uh, when applying AI solutions. So we should follow, we should carefully do this implementation and follow specific scenarios. So that's, it's very important that you've shown this so that we can, so that the audience understands it's it's not simply plug and play. And I'm 100% sure that the next speaker, which is Dennis Groen, is able to discuss this in further detail. Um, I've, I've been working with Dennis uh, at the ETZ hospital for implementing several AI solutions. And um, he's uh, he knows all about it as the project manager 
He was a project project manager of uh, implementation of these solutions. But now I think Dennis, correct me if I'm wrong, you're called the uh, innovation architect of the hospital. So you're now working on a on a larger scale outside of the department. Um, so yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Dennis Groen. I work as an information architect. Um, and indeed I was involved in a lot of AI projects uh, as a project leader. Um, and we've been working closely together. Uh, so it was great. Also on one of the projects, I won't be sharing any slides, so I will be just talking to you guys. Um, I will be talking about one of the AI projects we did in ETZ, um, and that is the implementation of the Bone Viewer algorithm from Gleamer, which started around March 2021. It was an, an initiative taken by the radiology department, and project management and implementation was done by IT. And we had a goal um, because in ETZ, we have a large number of x-rays being made on a daily basis within the emergency department. And the x-ray technicians are creating the images on which the radiologists uh, will report their findings. And for a number of those studies, um, there is a need to decide whether or not the patient has to stay in for further treatment. And in case of doubt, um, the x-ray technicians have, well, can interrupt radiologists to or give them any feedback if the patient has to stay in or not. So those number of times the radiology is interrupted, well, that's not very pleasant and you want to reduce that. Next to this, we um, also during night shifts, uh, x-rays images are being diagnosed by doctors from the emergency departments and also trauma surgeons. And all these images are then being reviewed in the morning with the radiologist to see if there were any misdiagnosis during night shifts. And if that was the case, then the patient has a recall and he has to come back to the hospital. So, and we really want to limit that number of times that we have to recall a patient back to the hospital. So those two goals were the main goals to see if the bone viewer algorithm could help us out there. So we first started um, in a phase one where we looked at uh, the algorithm in a retrospective analysis of around 600 cases. And we did the first validation of the algorithm if it was working fine or not. And the outcome of that was that the false negative of the algorithm was around three times and the false negative of the radiologist was one time, uh, seven times. So they are more or less the same. And the false positive of the algorithm was around five times and the false positive on the radiology was one time. So here the radiologist did a better job. But if you look at the percentages of those numbers, they are quite quite similar. So they are all around 1% at maximum. So this was for us a good enough result to go to phase two. And phase two was a retro retrospective analysis of prospective evaluation. Um, and in that we used it really uh, within the workflow. Uh, we did that for a couple of months. And uh, the outcome of that was that the algorithm was classified as trustworthy and the users find it simple to get access to the results. And we showed the results in our Sectra box as an extra column where we stated uh, three outcomes. If there was a fracture, it stated fracture. If there was no fracture, it stated no fracture. And if there was any doubt, it stated doubt. And uh, the images were also available for our caretakers and you could open them and there was a highlight if, in case of a fracture and a doubt where that fracture probably will be. So the outcome of that uh, prospective study was actually really fine, but we had a hard time on quantifying the real benefits of using the algorithm in your workflow um, and to justify the running costs of the algorithm and to make a sound business case. And actually what we should have done in the beginning was being more smart in a more smart way, describe what we really want as a desired outcome. Um, so that we, during the project, we could have measured more on how much time did it take uh, when a uh, radiology was interrupted, how many times, how many times it, during a day did that happen? How much time did it take from the radiologist when he was interrupted? Um, how many patients were called back before the use of the algorithm and how many were being called back after the algorithm. So all those things, those smart, smart numbers 
you have to think of that upfront because it helps you um, make a sound business case when you think and when you find when your findings are positive. And that business case is really important because if you don't get that business case, you probably won't get the funding to get it in production. So um, once we once we were finished with that prospective study and we, we were still struggling to get that sound business case, our research, our emergency department came up and a couple of doctors wanted to do a research study on how the algorithm is performing in their workflow. And if they could, um, based on that study, get some real benefits out of the algorithm and really could define what, uh, uh, what benefits there are using the algorithm. So we helped them uh, get that trial in place and it's still running right now. We are going to be working on the last number of patients to be included. And we hope that that outcome will help us get the information we need to make a sound business case and get the algorithm up and running in production. But on the IT challenges, um, if you look at the architectural point of view, um, implementing the AI solution itself isn't isn't really hard. It's, it's just implementing IT stuff. Um, most of the times it's a SaaS solution. Uh, you have to send images to the SaaS solution and you will get the result back and you can present it within your packs or in another application. That isn't really hard. Of course, it takes up uh, VPN connections, firewall rules. You need to think of contracting, all those things, but that's all doable. That's all IT stuff. Um, what's really difficult and what we also find in this project was that we had to find the right conditions where we could send the right images to the algorithm. And actually, we couldn't do that. We had to send more to the algorithm than we really wanted because we didn't have any fields on which we can really clearly say, well, this is the image that we want to automatically send to the algorithm. So upfront, you also have to think on how can I place filters on what information or what images do I want to send to the algorithm and do I want to have analyzed and get the result back in the end application. And uh, it's really hard. So sometimes you have to make a choice and send more knowing that, um, and that you send too much, but sometimes it's simply not doable to filter more. Um, but think of that upfront because it can save you a lot of time within your project. And it can also save you a lot of money because if you're sending more to the algorithm, you also have to pay more. The next challenge, um, what we have to face is that since more of these AI solutions are coming in, they, and most of the times it's our SaaS solutions, um, they will be bringing their own gateway server to send the information to the algorithm. So I really see an increasing number of extra gateway servers, which are taking care of the integrations to the SaaS platforms of the vendors. And the number of gateway servers is therefore growing and it will take up more support from IT. We'll have to manage more VPNs. We'll have to make, configure and maintain more firewall rules. We have uh, to maintain more OSs. So, and depending on your environment, if you use one pack system, you can probably do it, uh, your PEX system could probably be doing a job there because they have marketplaces and they can also do some anon anonymization and be sending information to the algorithm and get it back. But then you're still looking at only that PEX system and you have multiple applications within your hospital, which also, um, where also AI could be of benefit. And you also want to send information from that application perhaps to a SaaS solution, or you have another image application on which you want to send up, uh, images to a SaaS solution and get results back. So your PEX system will probably cover a certain number, but it would not cover everything. So you'll have to look at if there's a platform which you can use where anonymization can take place and where you can centralize your integrations to the SaaS platforms and well, send, send from your applications, send that information to the SaaS algorithms and get the results via that gateway back to your applications. And we are currently working with, uh, with Osmus to see if that platform of Osmus can help us there in well, centralizing all those uh, 
all those connections to the SaaS solutions. So as takeaways, what I really want to give you um, as takeaways is that before you start any AI project, really make clear and a smart definition of your desired outcomes. So you know what you have to measure during your pilot phases and it will help you get a sound business case. Make clear what you need as an outcome for a, for a sound business case. You probably can inform already upfront what the running cost will be of that algorithm once you want to have that in production. And if you know the, the bandwidth of that cost, then you also know what challenge you have within your project and where, what, what you need well, to justify um, when implementing that algorithm. And within your IT infrastructure, think about how you want to keep control on the growing integrations uh, with SaaS services. Centralize where possible and think how you can place filters on what to send to the algorithm or not. Um, so you really can only send what you really want to send and not anymore. So those are the takeaways. And it's probably back to you, Eric. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Dennis. Of course, you make me think of a lot of things. And Yes, we're talking about it of our, out of our experience, of course, but there's, there's still a few questions that I would like to ask you. Um, first of all, uh, I think you you also know, of course, you are one of the co-founders of um, the end user group in the hospital to make discussions about the type of AI solutions that can be implemented. And of course, selections will have to be made, decisions will have to be made, uh, investments have to be made. So. I think uh, you you will agree with me that this is also essential, not only to, let's say, uh, take care of the infrastructure and, and the, a good gateway, but also the organization uh, in, within the hospital uh, on, on the level of uh, hospital-wide project, AI project management, let's say. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I think you, have, you need to have a governance in place, which is, uh, well, uh where you have multiple stakeholders presented in that government uh, governance structure and yes. they all can give their knowledge from their point of view uh, right away up front before you start the project yeah and that that really helps that really helps yeah so because as as i also mentioned in my lecture uh, it's not only radiology ai will, will of course uh let's say will increasingly being used in other specialties as well so there we have to make choices but also this will also this will increase the demand for uh connections gateways and um so actually the most ideal situation and correct me if i'm wrong uh would be one single gateway to one single marketplace on which all possible ai solutions are being offered or what do you think about that yeah, that would be great. <laughs> and also that anonymization will take place at that gateway. Yeah, that's because, that, so that, of course, from a management point of view, this is this would be really ideal, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, it probably needs to be a marketplace which is vendor neutral. So, I, yeah. so yeah. apart from it, it really has to be a layer between the AI solutions and your infrastructure. So this that would also uh, help us or uh, to solve this, the problem which is currently existing, which is the, the shortage in AI um, uh, staffing uh, or IT staffing. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it really helps there because when we when I have a large number of gateways uh, to maintain, or instead I could have one, it makes the well maintaining the gateway more easy. Yeah, and it's fair, much more efficient. Yeah. yeah. You also know that AI applications following the medical device regulation have to be monitored. So yep. we will also need a way of doing this, uh, which will become complicated. The more application we use, the more application we will have to monitor. So actually, this is asking for a dashboard kind of system to do this. Uh, so what's your idea about that? Yeah, I think a dashboard system indeed, because uh, also on the gateway server, you need some logging and dashboard service there because and, and you also have one place where you can, uh, well, have a neutral view on if what is being sent to the algorithm and what has come back. And you also have to think on how you want to do the quality assurance on your algorithms. Do you really believe the certification that is in place or are you going to do well, a couple of times on a regular basis, check yourself with a radiologist if the AI algorithm is still performing the way it should. 
And I think you have to do that. And in this, um, if you want to document that, and you have a, a gateway server in place where logging is taking place, you can also, well, validate uh, and see what was being uh, what was being sent to the algorithm, what has come back, and you can make a documentation on that. And well, you have everything in place for a validation there. Yeah. Yeah, and of course. Uh, establishing such a quality monitoring system is not easy. We will have to find ways to do that. Maybe we yep. will have to uh, do some, let's say, uh, comparison, a match or a matching between the AI analysis and then the final reports, etc. So there's yep. still a lot of work to be done in that domain, I think. Yeah, I think that's also one of the things where um, where radiologist comes in again and where perhaps they, they also have a task in well, performing performing those validations and helping uh, to get that validated. Mm -hmm. So it's perhaps also a skill that uh, that also needs to be trained. Yep. Um, this is opening doors for new kinds of uh, professions and new kinds of skills, I think. <laughs> yep. <laughs> OK. Eric. Um, yeah. Dear Eric, we, we have several questions online from the audience. Oh, I was so looking at the, the Q&A box. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Exactly. There's first question to you. Well, um, I think we answered the. Oh, I, I was seeing the answers. Okay, there's an answer a question about um, uh, telling the audience about the extra results of implementing the bone view AI in the ETC. Yes, okay, this is absolutely interesting. Um, of course, we also measured the impact of using these uh, this solution on the uh, work satisfaction and. Uh, of, of not only the radiologists, but also the radiographers. And this is actually quite relevant because for them, it's not always easy either. Uh, if they have to look for radiologists who can validate the reports before a decision can be made about the treatment of the patient. For example, sometimes radiographers have to make a decision whether the patient has to be sent home or to the emergency department. And this is especially the case for the outpatients coming from from the general petitioner so we measured this we evaluated this and this is also of course a way of adding value to the uh, work environment and to the radiology practices to make people to facilitate the workflow for them and to make them feel comfortable with the decisions they make and the way uh, they can help patients and the speed by which they can do this um, and now as as Dennis already said uh, we are evaluating this with the emergency physicians, because also for them, this has a real impact, especially during on-call services. So um, that's, that's I think, a question to the answer here. Um, yeah, and I want, to, I want to add to that. If an AI algorithm can help on, on the task for the caretaker, um, that, that's really a big issue because actually the quality of care currently is not our biggest problem, um, but keeping the current quality with the same limited amount of people, that is. So if we can um, just just give them some advantages in their work, give them more confidence in their work, uh, that really adds up. So those are also soft wins, which you, well, perhaps they don't, don't really help for a financial business case, but you have to address them. There's a few other questions, Sergey. Will you uh, ask them? So there are questions, uh, quite many actually. Of them. No, so with respect again, to, yes. <laughs> yeah. So with respect to image quality requirements, how do human AI systems uh, compare? In other words, does it require better and it worse uh, image quality to obtain given? Well, uh, the, the, so there's a lot of magic expectations about AI being able to see what nobody else could see. And there have been recently an interesting study to compare AI with the ground truth of expert or with the ground truth of CT, analyzing X-ray with uh, com compared with CT or with, with expert. And the thing is that AI is not performing so well to to be magic, to, to find out what is not visible actually on the, on the images. There's a huge research being underway on radiomic side in order to really drag more information out of what, what exists on the images. But we should be really careful because the, uh, there, there might be biases, there might be errors which are brought to image interpretation and which might uh, actually present something which is not available. So we should not be guessing on images. 
and the, every method has its limitations. So when X-ray cannot provide diagnosis, it cannot provide diagnosis. We should we should not try to get more out of that than it allows to to see. So the, that's it. So with AI, we can reach the level of the expert, but we probably cannot go above that yeah. unless we combine and aggregate and go for big data. Combine AI. Eric was perfectly explaining about uh, about that when we combine AI radiology analysis with laboratory, with pathology, with image, uh, with additional clinical data, patient data, then we, but then it's not just image analysis. This, this is even more. Yes. But of course, Dennis, this is, uh, uh, Sergey, you also mentioned the phases, phase one, phase two, in such a prospective phase, what we also do is, of course, fine tuning the algorithm because the results uh, coming out of the algorithm might be depending on the image quality of the hospital and the different machines that we're working with. So if you find, if you take chest x-rays with different buckies and different other machines, then of course the algorithm will have to be will have to perform uh, in a similar way to all these uh, images. So this is where you do the fine tuning in the second phase. Then you can maybe even change the threshold regarding sensitivity and specificity of the algorithm. And this is also what we did, uh, and this has been very successful because then that's the only way to gain trust in the algorithm. And this is the way where you will be successful in, in implementing such a solution. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, really good. Another interesting question from Anouk. Uh, do you notice uh, Shan is working with AI in radiographers? So um, I, I would answer, I, th I think quite simple. So we speak currently a lot about AI. But in years to come, AI would be just a part of our typical work. That would be just, just part of the images. So we would not be able to, 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 to consider how we did that before without AI. So what, what is shy? It's coming up uh, everywhere. Uh, using Excel was uh, a novelty many, many years ago, but now we just... Uh, Routine tool. So that the same with AI. If you allow me to add something to that, Sergey, uh, we experience this with our radiographers. There's a lot of uh, fright. Um, people are afraid because of unawareness. This is also the case for radiologists. Some radiologists are afraid of AI because it will replace them. Radiographers might be afraid of using it for the same reason. But usually, this is because of a lack of knowledge, a lack of insight. And this is also. Uh, an argument to, uh, let's say, stimulate uh, communication and to, to stimulate the teaching and the information that is being provided around this subject, because everybody will confront it with it, but it's better to do it to, to do it in a prepared way so that they know what they will be working with and what kind of effect it will have. And it's very important to evaluate this as well. So this is, in my opinion, also part of the implementation of such solutions that it's all about communication, information, and gaining trust. That's my yeah. idea about it. Yeah, and it's uh, not new. It's not new, uh, Eric, because it's actually all new technology has to do with those phases. So it's not it's not only for AI. It exactly. has to come with all new technology. Yeah, I'm I'm reviewing some papers uh, uh, for 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 journals, and I've been observing recently and reviewing the paper which was uh, running a survey of physician expectations about AI and physicians who haven't had any experience, who hadn't had any experience before with AI were questioned about their usage, for the usage of AI. And the questions were super general. So how would you believe in AI? How would you think you would use AI? And that brings the problem and the bias of anthropomorphization of AI. But we should not think about AI as a, as a human being, as a superhuman being. It's not. It's an algorithm. It's a software as medical device, it's which statistics. has its own limitations. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. So we should not be afraid of that as, an, as, a, as a creature. It's not a creature. It's something that we teach and let into the clinical practice with uh, its uh, limitations and, and advantages. And advantages, that's it. Maybe we can yeah. conclude this webinar with uh, this saying from one of the attendees. He says, there is an old saying in imaging, uh, which is as follows. There is a difference between obtaining enhanced image and enhancing obtained image. And maybe we should learn on, and be able to see the difference. And I think, yes, this is true. Uh, AI will enable us to see more than we think. And um, 
we will have to adapt to that as well. So I think this is an excellent way to conclude the discussion. I would thank certainly you. want to, I would like to thank you all for your contribution. It's uh, a pity that Giovanni is not here, uh, but okay, um, this is the way it is. And excellent. I, I think we learned a lot today and I hope this is the same for the attendees. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks again to yeah. Asamis for having sponsored this event. Thank you. And I wish thank you all you. a nice Let's day. go for- Let's go for the football now. Let's go. And let's go for platforms. Thank you all. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.